All right. Hello, everybody. I'm Naomi Clark, uh, and I'm here with Jongwoo Kim, Kim of Kitfox Games. Uh, and uh, you guys have just been watching a stream, if you've been with us for the last hour, of uh, Deer playing this game, Lucifer Within Us. Uh, and I am going to talk with Jongwoo for a little bit about this game. And in the background, we're going to play some gameplay footage. Um, uh, similar, uh, the demo that you just saw Deer playing, uh, but from a recording from, that someone had played a while ago. So without further ado, uh, I don't know, let's start rolling that footage. And we, we can just have it play in the background while we're talking about the game. All right, so we just saw this game end on a huge cliffhanger, Jongwoo. Um, <laughs> there was a big accusation from this character that we see here on the left, uh, Ada, who's the like the investigator, right? Uh, or the inquisitor, is that her official title? She's the uh, exorcist uh, in this world. And so um, she is empowered to uh, investigate uh, incidents of demonic possession and uh, discover uh, who committed the crime and what demon was uh, driving the culprit. And so like, it's worth mentioning that the game takes place in like a, a world that's somewhat different than ours. Uh, it's, a, it's a futuristic society, but it's a theocracy. It's a very much of a moralist society and has a very uh, strict beliefs about uh, what is uh, righteous and not. And so in, in that way, like, there hasn't been a murder in this country. In, a hundred years, and uh, Ada at the start of like in the, the beginning of this case is sent in to uh, investigate that first murder in a century. Right, and so when Deer was getting to the end of this demo, she had kind of determined, okay, who who the murderer was. Right. I won't spoil it for anyone who wasn't watching the last hour of gameplay, but uh, made an accusation. Um, and I'm really curious because that's that's right where the demo ends. It kind of ends on this cliffhanger of like, okay, you made the accusation, uh, and now I guess in the the eyes of the church of this world, uh, a heinous deed like this could only happen if you're actually being possessed by uh, by demons. Is that right? Right. That, that's essentially it. So imagine in the sense of like in a very hierarchical and structured society in which you're taught from birth about how to. Behave, like how to be a good person, right? Why would you ever voluntarily choose to do something like commit a murder, right? Surely that can only happen if um, you were possessed by an external, like a force of some sort. Um, but like, it, it's worth mentioning that uh, in context of this particular world, uh, I mentioned that it's a futuristic theocracy. So the demons that um, that they encounter. Uh, they are digital in nature. Everyone has cybernetic implants um, in their bodies. Uh, you can kind of see some of that in their foreheads, like a mark, like a, a marking of uh, called the eye of providence. So, like everyone has like a different level of so cybernetic and, uh, implants, and as a result, they become vulnerable to cyber demonic possession. So, demons are very real in their consciousness, and they are a clear threat in their consciousness. Uh, at the same time, they were very certain that uh, through good deeds and uh, good, good behaviors, uh, they were largely immune to their influence. And yet uh, this murder has happened. And they, that's the overarching mystery of the game. So I guess I, I, I don't want to ask you to uh, give away too much because it's part of the tantalizing part of seeing a demo and wondering what the full game is going to be like. But are the demons... Uh, is there anything you can say about the nature of the demons in this world? Are they like a are they like a ghost in the machine kind of idea that there's some sort of uh, product of having cybernetic technology implanted in your brain? They are definitely tied to the cybernetic technology, but the, it is it is worth thinking about them as like. Um, like very much so, like in, in terms of like uh, how like a re Renaissance philosopher might have thought that uh, you know uh, demons were literal, like in this, like while still like uh, keeping in mind the scientific progress of the time, like in their minds there really is no separation between the digital and the spiritual. So the demons are real, but they're also digital in nature. Nice. This is it's such an unusual combination. This. Uh sort of intense, almost um, medieval 
theocratic society with uh, a, a cyberpunk future, right? Something that right. I feel like I've only seen it maybe maybe one time before. And it's funny uh, because I was talking a, a while back with a bunch of people online about the upcoming cyberpunk uh, release of later this year, yeah. of, uh, Cyberpunk 20, 2070, right? Is that what it is from, from CD Projekt Red? Yeah. And I was saying, oh, you know, it looks like such a generic, generic cyberpunk world. Uh, it doesn't have the sort of intense extra flavor that uh, Lucifer Within Us has. But I, then I was comparing it to other so, so that game is based on a 90s role-playing game, right? Cyberpunk yeah. 2020. And around the same time, there was another role-playing game that came out called Torg, where Torg. One, of the, one of the worlds you could visit was was the cyber papacy, which, which was like a theocratic state um, that involved a lot of cybernetic implants. So I have to ask you, like, have you ever heard? That it's an obscure 90s role-playing game. I would be shocked <laughs> if you had heard of, had heard of it. But, yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I mean, I have to confess, I haven't heard of it, but I'd love to, you know, like find out more about it. So yeah, like uh, you said, it was Torg. Yeah, it's uh, the the game is called Torg, T O R G. Okay. And they came out with a like, it's a very weird game. There are yeah. like six different colliding dimensions, but one of them is the is the cyber papacy. Yeah. Um, and yeah, in that one, yeah, the, the Catholic Church are clearly um, the bad guys, yeah. and they um, they only allow people who are free of sin to get cybernetic implants. It strikes me as a little different here, although I don't know. I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna take a wild guess here that maybe there's some moral morally compromised stuff going on within the church in your world as well that maybe the player character has to contend with. <laughs> <laughs> I won't spoil anything, but I mean certainly the. Um there's moral grayness even in a world that tries to assume moral absolutism so yeah that's uh, uh, like any like the church uh, claims to uh, hold like a, or uh, be the, uh, the defender of truth in this world right. and of course that's all the more reason to suspect it in a mystery game like this yeah, it's interesting. And so they they have a, they're a very clear authority in this world where they've right. managed to maintain peace and order for a hundred years. But now there are cracks appearing in that facade, and, and uh, I'm, that must uh, lead to some kinds of further problems. Right. Yeah. Uh, it's interesting to make a game like that, uh, like this, with a story like that, in a time when people are constantly talking about can we still have faith in institutions? Right. right. That's such a theme. Um, has that did, has that come into your guys' discussions about the story and themes of this game at all? Like, how are you thinking about the relationship between I don't know, yeah, authority institutions in the real world and like what's going on with the church uh, in Lucifer within us? Right. Um, so th this might be a little bit of a long-winded answer, uh, but uh, so some of the um, basis for like. Uh, Paradigm around truth, uh, where Lucifer within us came from, like uh, my, uh, the previous project that I led, uh, uh, the Shrouded Eye, uh, in which uh, the player is the head of a murderous cult that worships a Lovecraftian god um, and is investigating townspeople for their sinful behaviors. Uh, but the, that was like a that looked at this, uh, the question of uh, like organizational evil from like the organization's uh, perspective or the like almost like the managerial perspective. Uh, but this is more so on like well, given a certain structure, uh, the people like a uh, given the structure that actually tries to do what it claims to like it, it tries to enforce peace it tries to uh, regulate behavior like i mean like at, at some level like uh, there was some genuine attempt to do goodness uh but it's still oppressive uh what happens in the uh the personal space like what happens in the personal moments and so uh, one thing about this game is that uh, the, the cases and the people involved in it like uh, like let's just look at the the case that, that we're showing in the uh, the footage right now. There's two brothers and the uh, priestess who who was killed, and because it's one brother's word against the other, uh, at the start of it, it is uh, quite unclear uh, what has happened. Really, like uh, like either version of events like could have happened, and of course, as an investigator, it's your role to. Uh, really uh, dig in and figure out what truly happened. Uh, but 
like at some level, like there is a sense of, well, why are you empowered to do that? Uh, like, what makes you an impartial observer in this situation? And uh, something that I notice um, in, you know, having watched uh, multiple playthroughs of this case, like with different playtesters, uh, uh, I do find that uh, it's easy for, uh, depending on your own like uh, subject experiences or like uh, encounters with certain kinds of people, it's easy to uh, jump ahead and jump to conclusions about who did it, uh, because this type of person tends to do these type of things. But uh, but the evidence doesn't necessarily align to. Uh, uh, that initial belief about what happened, right? And and so like, I, I guess like, uh, I have some like a uh, training in history. So like I, I did a uh, BA in Soviet history, and like something that interests me about history is the, this belief that well, if we really go back and find everything that we can find about it, uh, we can discern what happened, like in an objective sense, but. For something that's a personal moment, something that is like very much driven by uh, passion, like you know, our inner passions and money, can we really do that? Um, and, and that's uh, that's the uh, what the Lucifer within us explores essentially, like uh, like given the murkiness of um, interpersonal relations and our own inner drives, uh, can we really uh, understand truth uh, in context of all these terrible things that are happening? Right. I thought it was really interesting that um, there are multiple layers of psychology going on with these characters. And in this demo, at least for one of the characters, uh, you know, the one who sort of turns out to be the, um, the culprit, right. I, I think, right, that you actually sort of go down one layer deeper. Um, right. And so for, for the, the, the one of the brothers, his sin that he's associated with is pride, right? And um, and the other brother, it's envy. A, a kind of maybe a classic clash between those two. But then the 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 brother who's envious, it's actually a little bit hidden beneath a, be, beneath other things like the fact that he's a devout believer. Right. right? Yeah. Yeah. So the I, I guess it's those types of uh, components that give give the player an opportunity to kind of jump onto making an accusation and maybe like uh, act on their own personal biases and be like, oh, this. Right. And, and you've made both of the characters kind of dislikable in different ways, right? They're For definitely, sure. you know, full of some resentment or they have like a chip on their shoulder and stuff like that. So, uh, yeah, that, and that's really interesting. I noticed that, so there's one thing that's interesting in this game that I think is a little bit different uh, from some other um, mystery games where you try to figure out who the culprit is. And that's like you can just make accusations uh, as much as you want, right? You can make an accusation that can turn out to be wrong, but, um, you know, there are some other games, like even going back to games like Clue, right? Yeah. The granddaddy of this this type of um, this type of goal, uh, where if you make an accusation and it's wrong, like, that's it. You, you lose, right? You have to go back to an earlier save, which is maybe, like, what's the point of that? But yeah. what, what can you talk about the decision to, to have consequence-free accusations? Yeah, um... That was a long road, to be honest. Um, and um, earlier in development, um, I wished for more consequences to happen as a result of uh, either failed contradictions or failed accusation. Uh, but um, but uh, the reason why we've arrived at it here is in part for like, I guess like uh, the Ludo narrative uh, dissonance, re like avoiding Ludo narrative dissonance in the sense of I mean, um, like some mystery games tend to have uh, arbitrary punishments. So, you know, uh, Phoenix Wright or, uh, you know, LA Noir, for instance, uh, they have, you know, a point system. Well, Phoenix Wright, uh, sorry, Phoenix Wright is more like a light bar. And if you're wrong, then, you know, you lose a certain amount of the bar and uh, it creates the risk, but it's not clear why that uh, bar needs to exist or like a, what the punishment really is. Right. Or, or um, just, it's so embarrassed you're like I give yeah, up. <laughs> ex exactly. And, and so um, 
one of the things like being considered like very 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 early on was hey uh, if you're wrong about something uh, maybe there's like a branching path uh, to uh, like uh, in which like hey uh, you know you exorcise the wrong person there was no demon in that person actually uh, and the story moves forward uh, based on that but in part due to scope reason and in, also in part due to just in terms of um, complexity reasons um, at some level, I think that um, the game needs to be based on a layer, like a bottom rock layer of objective truth. Hey, these are the uh, actions that actually happened, and these are the physical evidence that it left, and therefore um, it's only possible if, to reach this conclusion if you consider these factors. Like otherwise, that the um, uh, the investigative and the deductive gameplay may be dissatisfying or so open to interpretation that uh, there is no meaningful challenge, so to speak. Uh, but but at the same time, like uh, pointlessly punishing the player for uh, what could be valid uh, reason without giving the reason why, um, you know. So like that's why like uh, we've arrived at the current accusation system where um, if you present something. Um, if it's valid, even if it's not the correct answer, um, the suspect will accept that uh, response. But if it's something that is actually incorrect in the sense of there's evidence uh, which suggests otherwise, or um, they are, are so, um, oops, sorry, uh, they're so certain that. Um, they're so certain about this because you know they actually do believe in this uh, in those kind of situations the uh, suspects will uh, make a counterclaim um, and depending on the situation there might be a second attempt to uh, force the suspect to uh, tell the truth that they're lying or the you know you accept the, you know their counterclaim so it felt more closer to like what you expect uh, an actual investigator to do right, right? Yeah, because an actual investigator might make an accusation, maybe even to pressure a suspect, right? Right, yeah. Be like, come on, admit it. But if they don't actually have an ironclad case or something, they could still be sort of stonewalled by by that suspect. For sure, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. So in this case with the two brothers, you can make, you can construct an accusation that actually seems perfectly plausible against the first brother. Uh, yeah. And it seems, it feels like the kind of accusation that like, okay, maybe, um, a, a, a cop, an investigator like this who is doing a, a very cursory, cruddy job would just be like, okay, yeah, that seems like a cut and dry case, right? Right, right. But, sure. but of course, in the in actual mystery novels, that always turns out to be like not the correct answer, right? It's too too obvious to right. be true. Um, but then when you make that accusation, you just, the, the first brother, the, the brother who didn't do it, just says like, what, that's totally wrong. Why would I do that? I, you know, I loved the the victim. Right. Um, and yeah, and then you sort of get this psychological feeling like, okay, I'm not, I haven't gotten this character to, uh, their defenses to crumble. Right. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, I think it's, it's interesting, kind of, a, kind of effective. Um, and, and I guess the, yeah, could you talk a little bit, you mentioned Phoenix Wright just now. Yeah. Uh, and I guess there, I, I think of that game and also uh, games like Danganronpa as maybe being uh, predecessors it, uh, that have kind of fiddled around with those types of things. Like, what does For it sure. mean to fail at an accusation? How do you keep this plot rolling forward? Right, with, right. Um, you know, with multiple layers of accusation or multiple, multiple suspects? Right. Um, yeah, like, did you draw influence or inspiration from those games or were there lessons learned that you wanted to do some stuff differently? So um, there's definitely huge, huge influences from Phoenix, right? And so like uh, the um, testimony contradiction system, in essence, is uh, uh, is based on Phoenix Way. It's uh, you know uh, present something like you know, objection, you know right. uh, that classic moment. Um, but as far as um, moving past it, that's something that's. Um, it, that I find problematic with uh, both uh, Phoenix Wright and Duncan uh, like moving past the, the punishment system, mm -hmm. is that uh, at some level the uh, the player is uh, bound by the narrative structure of how that case is supposed to be told. Right. And so uh, in Phoenix Wright's case, like some of the longer cases, uh, even if you have the evidence. Uh, 
which like around which uh, you know the entire case like in you know, the seesaws uh you can't really talk about it uh you can't talk about it until a phoenix realizes that hey actually yeah that, that's kind of important right right because it's sort of like you're like oh gosh phoenix please put the pieces together <laughs> yeah exactly exactly <laughs> And um, and uh, Dangan Rompa handles it in a different way, in which uh, there is a very, 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 very clear investigative phase, and there is a very clear debate phase in which like uh, the arguments actually happen, right? right. Um, but even in that case, like uh, I, I would think that uh, in order to make the case fair for the players, it would be if the player had the opportunity or was straight up given. All the evidence prior to going to the debate phase, but for dramatic effect, they tend to hide certain pieces of evidence. Like so, like uh, like one of the other characters will basically pull it out of their pocket, like during um, the debate phase, and so like like that usually tilts uh, the uh, uh, one's interpretation of the case entirely, uh, and that's the intended effect. And I appreciate what they're trying to do, right? Uh, but uh, from perspective of someone who is less interested in watching a uh, fictional character solve the case and someone who actually wants to solve the case themselves. That is entirely unfair and frustrating because in the first, this first scenario, in Phoenix Wright scenario, um, I saw that coming um, and I couldn't do anything about it. In the second scenario case, I didn't see that coming and I couldn't, you know, like there was nothing I could have done about it. And so uh, Lucifer Within Us is designed in an open uh, player directed way. So the player doesn't have infinite freedom, um, but anything that is locked away, that's because the suspects do not wish to cooperate with you. There's something that they're hiding from you. The physical evidence, on the other hand, is there and is open for you to interpret as you wish. And you can ask about anything at any time. And so it's depending on you know one's intuitions and you know perhaps like you know like uh, one's uh, like a. I don't know, like familiarity with certain like tendencies or like a, I guess like a, uh, I, I don't know, like it, certain people might have like a, like might find it a little bit less satisfying because maybe like they jump ahead, they get to jump ahead, they see it happen, like they see the clear path into the screen, and as a result, um, you know, like there's fewer things to do per se because there's fewer required steps to get to the end. Right. But at the same time, you have the the opportunity to do so. Um, if you are an astute investigator, uh, or if you want to thoroughly examine everything, you can do that too. Uh, but you know, it's on you. You're you're the one who's here after all. You're the one who's investigating. Yeah, and it was interesting. Like you can you can kind of jump around. Like there isn't a discrete investigation and questioning phases like there are in those other games. You can kind of like walk over to investigate the murder scene and then walk back and have some conversation and just very fluidly move back and forth between them and it, it, uh, it struck me when I was playing that it does have this sort of open-endedness where you get a, you get a little bit like okay I'm not sure what I should be doing right now um, because there are a bunch of possibilities like multiple people to question and I could see how in a more complex case where maybe there are you know three or more suspects or, or other people to, to interrogate or talk to who aren't even suspects, right? That, right. Um, you, yeah, you could get uh, like, uh, I don't want to say, it's it's not that you could get overwhelmed by the possibilities, because of course you can, there are still going to be constraints, but it gives you a little bit of this puzzly feeling where you have to like sit for a second with your hand on your chin and be like, okay, what should I investigate next? Right. And really force you to review the evidence. Because when you're playing Phoenix Wright games, it's always like, okay, there are a few choices that are right in front of you. And you kind of just have to, you know, be like, okay, which is the right one? Um, and, and and pick until you get it right. Or maybe you have to like uh, reload a sa the earlier save if you, uh, if you lose your whole health bar. But those games, they feel like they have a little bit of a brute force approach that they can take because they, they are on this kind of tight, constrained path. And that might be part of the reason for the for the health bar to 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 limit that brute forcing. For sure, and uh, so like adding any sort of risk, uh, you know, will reduce you know players' tendencies to brute force. Uh, for what it's worth, I mean, there are I do notice in certain playtests, even for Lucifer within us, that like there will get to a certain point and they'll choose to brute force uh, rather than uh, consider things carefully. And at some level, I'm personally okay with it as long as uh, other players don't 
that like it feel satisfied in you know being able to look through the haystack as it were and find the needle that they want and uh, I feel satisfied in making the connections yeah because it's it's the kind of thing where maybe if you do that if you resort to it occasionally but the story is still interesting yeah. and you feel like the next time you get to a, a uh, you know, a head scratcher that you actually do have some material to think about. It might not right. be so bad to brute force it every once in a while. Right. Yeah. So I have to ask you that, you know, the, it occurs to me, uh, although the the cyber ecclesiastic uh, uh, theme does draw it quite a, a ways away from our, our the world that we live in, that this is uh, like, like a couple other popular games that have come out recently, like uh, Disco Elysium comes to mind. You're also an investigator um, trying to figure out, like, solve some mysteries in that game. Uh, it's another game where you're playing, uh, you're basically playing a cop, although in this case you're a church cop. Does, uh, and you guys have been working on this game for quite some time now, right? Like, is it a couple years at this point? It's about three years, yeah. Three years, yeah. So h how are you feeling uh, about putting out a game and promoting a game where you, you're you playing an investigator of crimes uh, in an atmosphere where now suddenly across the world, the, um, yeah, the, the police are being criticized uh, and sort of, yeah, taken down um, for, you know, many, many decades of, of brutality and, you know, treating treating suspects and people who are being arrested uh, extraordinarily poorly and, and, and killing people, right? So right. there's definitely a distance here, right? But does that, does that trouble you guys that you, that it's a, that the protagonist is a cop or do you not really think of her as a cop? It's an interesting question. So um, I want to answer that in two parts. Uh, the first part being like, uh, you know, the other detective and like mystery solving games that have come out and how it's changed since we started development. Um, so I'm ecstatic that there are more mystery games coming out. And I'm ecstatic that the, uh, the design in those games are exploring spaces that haven't been done before. I mean, you mentioned Disco Elysium and like the way that uh, it focuses on the psyche of like a one troubled cop um, in this like a small neighborhood really, but you know, really digs down into that neighborhood. Right. And, you know, there really isn't the, like, I mean, there is one combat encounter, so to speak, but that's not the point of the game. Like, in a role-playing game, that's that's amazing. And the fact that, you know, it's out there, like, I think it's just, uh, one thing that's always, um, like, uh, frustrated me is that the mystery is such a popular genre in other media, but in right. games, uh, it's somewhat niche. And maybe this is, like, uh, like uh, oh, a new wave of mystery games uh, that will make the genre more popular in games as well. And so that's the genre side of things. Um, as far as um, Ada and um, her role as uh, an exorcist and, you know, um, whether um, the recent events uh, regarding police brutality and the perceptions of violent authority um, affecting our concerns about Ada. Um, one thing that uh, I really wanted to emphasize during development uh, for her depiction was that she is not seen as a, a bruiser or like an enforcer like uh, she is the detective but not the like, you know the typical like a police like a beat cop uh, type of person right and so in that way i'm i'm glad that she doesn't use physical violence on anybody in the game uh, that said, um, the the act of exorcism itself is not voluntary, mm -hmm. and the fact that uh, it may be harmful to the person, uh, to the culprit, is uh, is something that is an intended part of the experience. And so, uh, I'm not sure how much we're contributing to the discussions about. Um, um, the appropriateness or the validity of the uh, police authority uh, with regard to this game, but uh, at least as far as uh, Ada is concerned, um, I think it would. Be, I think her depiction is uh, sensitive and sensible for our current circumstances. Yeah, that makes sense, and it's also, of course, it's a very. Uh, you're portraying a very different kind of society. Yeah. Where they're, you know, they've been so locked down 
um, or you know had, had such tranquility that there isn't really a need for for policing in the in the sense that we're we're, we're talking about right uh, right yeah and that the, and that even her role as sort of investigating crimes is, is sort of a relatively relatively new thing um, so in that sense you know maybe it is a a type of uh, escape, which the, the games are often really good at providing, like seeing like what a, a very different sort of world than that we live in. Like, what would it be like to be uh, an investigator in this society? I guess Disco Elysium kind of had that quality too, right? Because the the police in Disco Elysium also sort of like don't really have that much um, ability to exercise force, right? And they, they kind of made that distinction in that game. And I wonder whether it's um, yeah, I wonder whether it's a, in part maybe a, a way to write a setting where you, yeah, you can sort of step aside and not not address police brutality head on because maybe there are other themes that are worth exploring as well. Uh, and say like, look, this is a world where the, yeah, that kind of, that kind of policing and profiling and brutality uh, is, is not possible. <laughs> It's an interesting point. I mean, I guess if we were to have opportunity to expand upon this idea further, like uh, questions about uh, uh, questions about class or race in this society, would be interesting to explore, and definitely um, like what the inquisitors are actually doing on a day-to-day -day basis would be interesting. Uh, but uh, the focus of this particular uh, entry at, at the least is on, like, on a more of a personal level purge, it's, like a particular people at particular points in time. So, yeah. I want to throw it open also to, uh, to anybody who is in chat right now, if you have questions. I know uh, there are representatives of Kitbox Games. They're answering some of the questions. But if there's anything you'd like Zhang Wu or I to, to answer on stream, feel free to ask your questions. Uh, and then I think I, I've been asking a tons of things that are on my mind. I'm going to put one more thing out there uh, that I really wanted to ask you. So yep. I think I first encountered Kitbox Games back when you guys released uh, Shattered Planet. Oh, yeah, wow. Yeah, way back when. I remember playing that. Um, and that, that always felt to me a little bit like a, like a mobile game. Uh, maybe, maybe you guys did release it both for mobile and for PC? Yeah, so it started off as a mobile game. It started off as a mobile game, yeah. and uh, and it was a, a, a roguelike essentially, right? It was a roguelike that didn't have a lot of the traditional roguelike trappings, but that felt like a nice light a light roguelike that a mobile game player could get into. And that must be like like five or six years ago now that you guys released that game. Um, and then of course you're also known for games like uh, like Boyfriend Dungeon. Uh, and uh, Moon Hunters and Shrouded Isle that you, yeah. that you mentioned earlier. And all of those games have some uh, level of, of procedurally generated content. In them. Right? They're, yeah. they're, some of them are, are like straight up roguelikes with an interesting twist, like you can romance the weapons, uh, that you <laughs> play, right? Uh, yeah. And some of them like bring in procedural elements into storytelling and other things. And when I played the demo of Looser for then, I was like, I was, I was half expecting. I was like, oh, where's the, where's the kit box procedurality going to come in? Because you guys are also really good at creating interesting, compelling sci-fi and fantasy worlds. Uh, you know, like Moon Hunter set in ancient Mesopotamia kind of uh, setting, uh, and clearly Lucifer within us fits into that category. But it feels to me like actually, although it's more open than an extremely linear Dongon Ropa or Phoenix Wright. It feels like it doesn't really have that procedural flavor. Like it's it's uh, it's pretty authored. So is this like a new, different direction for you all? It's a direction that was taken for this particular project, um, but uh, it's even for Lucifer within us. Uh, it was a direction that evolved over time, and so in the very very early stages of the project, there was a desire to actually procedurally generate the cases. And so uh, one of the things we focused on was ensuring that, that there is like a systemic basis for the player's actions. So for example, hey, like if like get two characters say the same thing, uh, then yes, like if that is considered valid. Or like uh, if the, this uh, the object that you find has a certain property, um, then you know, similar objects have like that sort of property. So that uh, like once like uh, that groundwork is done, bam, we can 
generate infant cases was kind of a dream. Uh, but then um, what we discovered was that uh, there were certain expectations about mystery solving specifically uh, that was difficult to capture in context of uh, like in Procter, or at least like we had to doing so would have required us to spend much 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 more time on generation than uh, that was available for the project or like what we did for previous projects even and so i don't know i mean like a part of me still really wants to do a project mystery project at some point um unfortunately like uh, that's not to be listed for within us uh, but at the same time i am willing to say that the, like, as far as like the DNA of like a fraction uh, that's kind of represented in how the game works it is structured in such like a it tries to follow a certain internal logic it tries to follow rules about how a character like if a character can't walk somewhere or in time that really couldn't have happened uh, as far as like the, um, the case design is concerned you know or like uh, you might also see like at uh, the line of sight systems for instance uh, if a character uh, doesn't look at something they really didn't see it uh, and, and so uh, there's as much as it's not generated the systems that would have enabled it to be generated like to exist to some extent and being able to go back and forth in time uh, with uh, uh, with the physical properties of objects being intact like all of those things uh, I th think may serve <laughs> as a skeleton for perhaps a future project project but uh, who knows uh, I think Right, so what you're kind of saying is that there's a bunch of underlying logic that runs the world. It's not all just props uh, and and, and pre-scripted events happening and firing off, but there's a, yeah, there's a system that's like characters can see or not see certain things occurring. Uh, there are things that, you know, either do or don't happen at the same time, and that there's a, like a logic that arises from that that the player interacts with. Right. And it, it's not something that we draw too much attention to uh, because it doesn't immediately affect the player's experience. Um, but as, as far as our development process or like our design process for uh, cases, I think um, ultimately it comes together in a way that, uh, hey, like uh, that this fist actually happened because you know it physically happened according to the uh, in-engine systems, you know? Right. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. I think now that you're talking about it, I feel like I kind of noticed that in the texture of the game. It gives it a different a different flavor, a different feel to it, that you actually feel like there's some substance there when you're when you're looking closely at it or pushing it, um, rather than the kind of like a you know, cardboard cutout feeling of like, you know, I just threw this pre-scripted thing up there. Right. <laughs> that's, that's nice to see. So we did have some questions in, in chat. It looks like maybe uh, they've all gotten taken care of by your uh, kids exactly. already. But so you yeah. guys have not announced a release date for this game yet, right? It's uh, sometime sometime this year. That's actually half the year's gone already. So that's uh, and at least uh, the other half of the year. The other half at some point. <laughs> oh, a new new question just popped up. Maybe we can yeah. answer this one. With the uh, account's time mechanics, uh, any influences from the sexy brutal? Um, I, I won't say a direct influence, but it was definitely like on my radar when it came out, and it's an awesome game. Yeah. Um, that's yeah, sexy Valier, right? Yeah, that's a. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So. Sexy Brutal kind of looks at it from the opposite angle. So, like, uh, Sexy Brutal has a canonical set of events um, that happens on a time tip, right? And uh, you can alter those events somewhat if you manage to intervene in ways that you, that don't get you noticed by the other characters. In this book within us, there is a canonical, like, a timeline, but that won't be ex available to you until the end, again, when you've solved everything. Instead, you're giving multiple different timelines, and uh, you're trying to get the characters to uh, realign, realign what they say to reveal what actually happened, right? right. And so, like, it, I guess it's like a two different uh, like time manipulation fantasy. One is about like in our case, it's more about truth, and the uh, in their case, it's more about changing the past. Yeah, interesting. The re yeah the rewind in this it feels more like um, I realize what it reminded me of is Rashomon, right? The, yes, Rashomon is a like clear influence for sure. Yeah, yeah, that's excellent. It's just, this is might be one of the closest games to to Rashomon that that I've seen. Uh, in, in you know in the small mystery genre, so that's that's uh, really exciting to see. 
Uh, I feel like it's you know it's a good kind of a good tagline for the you know for the film nerds. Um, <laughs> Uh, that, but the fact that you actually get to see these different timelines and can scrub across them and then actually get to watch the the discrepancies when you switch from one person to another, it's a little bit like, oh, wow, it's like getting to watch all of Rosh, all of Rashomon at once, like super <laughs> close on each other, which is like a pretty cool, cool experience. Yeah. Awesome. Man. Yeah. Yeah, so maybe that's a that's a good might, might be a good place to leave it. Unless there's anything else that you wanted to to mention, Jong about the game, uh, or that you know you're excited about in uh, up, in finishing the development and releasing it. Um, honestly, I'm super excited to get it out uh, the door and into the hands of people who really love the game. So, like, thank you so much for watching the stream. And if you're curious about it, uh, please uh, wishlist the project on uh, Steam. So. Yeah, our uh, the wish list page for Elizabeth Lynn within us should be on this. All right, and I'm going to yeah. put into chat right now um, the wish list link where you can uh, put it on your wish list to help support this game. Uh, and I just wanted to mention a couple of things about this, this what we're doing here on the NDK Twitch channel before we, we say goodbye. So all summer long, um, on most weeks, on Wednesdays and Sundays, at the same time that uh, Deer started streaming this game, it's 11 Pacific time, uh, 2 two o'clock Eastern time. Um, uh, another game will be streamed out. Uh, these are all games that were selected for the Indicade E3 showcase. Uh, of course, this is a, a very different kind of year uh, for, for games that are selected for festivals and showcases. But uh, all of these developers and games are not only awesome and exciting to look forward to, but they also deserve our support. Uh, and they deserve to get, you know, get uh, the spotlight on them even if we're not all meeting up in person to celebrate at festivals. So I'm, I'm really happy to have been able to, to stream Lucifer within us uh, and you know give it a little bit more moment in the sun. Uh, so that's going to keep happening every week uh, with some Indicade uh, alumni like me. Uh, I was you know, part of the festival uh, in the past. There's going to be some uh, panels and tournaments and other types of uh, events going on. And then in the fall, there's going to be nine full days of 24-7 online festival programming in mid-October. Uh, that'll be really interesting to see. I guess we're going to maybe see a, a few how that goes with a few other events before we get to fall. Uh, but we'll all be having these kind of like online adventures continue. Uh, last note, uh, you can still submit games to indicate if you're a developer and you'd like to submit your game for consideration to be included in the fall festival submissions are still open at indicate.com slash submissions um all right so yeah wish list this game i i'm really excited to play it uh i really want to see more cases hopefully you are psyched too uh and let's give a round of applause to uh jongwoo and kitbox or at least i'll give a round of applause uh and thanks also to sean pierre uh, who has been running this stream from behind the scenes. Uh, of, he's of Philly Game Mechanics, an organization you might have heard of. So a uh, big round of applause to him, too. Thank you guys both. All right. So with that, I guess we're out of here. <laughs>